All right, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for attending Introduction to Diagnosis and Treatment of TM Dysfunction. My name is Tracy Wazinski, Business Development Coordinator at Office Sites, and this educational webinar is made possible by Dr. Rondo and Lee Larstone, who have done a great job putting this presentation together, and Office Site is a sponsor. Having built over 7,000 websites, Office Site is the official website provider for healthcare organizations we are dedicated to providing you with the educational tools needed for a successful practice. Our goal tonight is to educate you on some key components to help you succeed and just how impactful TMD can be on your practice. <coughs> Excuse me. A couple quick housekeeping items. This webinar does qualify you for PACE approved credit. So that's going to be one credit that you can receive for this webinar. And Lee Larstone will run point on that, so she'll be available for any questions you have on the CE credit. And we will have a test at the end for you to take and submit. So I'll be sure to make sure you get that not only in this webinar, but in our follow-up email, so you'll have that test to take. We're also going to be running some polls throughout the webinar, so keep an eye out for those. And be sure to participate when you do see them so that you get the most value from the session. Now, for the best audio and listening pleasure, we do recommend dialing in on a landline phone if possible. If not, that's not a problem. Listening in on the laptop or a cell phone will do. We just tend to see the best connection come through on a landline phone. So if you're finding yourself any, having any technical issues, just please reach out to go to webinar support for any troubleshooting. Next, if you take a look at your control panel, you'll see a questions tab. If you go ahead and type any questions in there as they come to mind, we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end with our live Q&A session. So as you're listening to Dr. Rondo speak, you can go ahead and type those questions in and we'll, um, we'll address those at the end with him. Lastly, there will be a quick survey at the end of the webinar to get your feedback. So if you can just take a minute or so to answer about five quick questions, we'd really love to know your thoughts on today's session. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to the man of the hour. Dr. Rondo has actually been teaching for over 35 years, having instructed over 20,000 dentists in seven countries. He's also a general dentist with nearly 50, or with over 50 years practicing, and he lectures 100 days of the year. Combine that with his 10 days a month that he practices, it's really easy to see. Dr. Rondo is not only very knowledgeable, but also just loves to help dentists in general. It's a real treat to have him here tonight, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and turn this over to him. And you can take it away, Dr. Rondo. Great. Thanks very much, Tracy. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I'm really happy that we've got the opportunity to speak about TMD dysfunction. Um, it's certainly something in dental school which none of us, I think, got a very good education on because it's not taught in most dental schools in North America or South America or anywhere. So um, anyway, I mean, I think it's very important, too, for dentists to realize that, that there's, there's, there's more and more dentists and fewer and fewer patients. So it's kind of good if you learn to get into other areas like orthodontics or TMD or sleep dentistry. And if you're interested in any of those three areas, I'd be happy to help you because we do have webinars on my, on my website and also on OfficeSite's website on those other subjects if you're interested. So anyway, I'm happy to have you tonight. And uh, let's talk about TMJ. That's jaw joint. When, you t when a patient says they got TMJ, it means temporal mandibular joint. Uh, when you're talking to a dentist, you should say temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. And I really think TM dysfunction should be diagnosed and treated prior to orthodontic treatment, restorative treatment, or prosthetic treatment. And unfortunately, that's not really what's being done by most practitioners because we weren't given proper grounding or a background on on TMD. So tonight I'm going to make it simple for you. Um, the first thing we have to do is, is there an external derangement? Is there a problem outside the temporal mandibular joint? In other words, is it a muscle problem due to clenching and bruxing or you shift it down to closal interferences? So what is it? Is there, or is it an internal derangement? Is there any noise within the joint? Is there any clicking? Is it a chronic closed lock where the patient can't open more than 30 millimeters or crepitus, loud noises? So the first thing you have to figure out, is it outside the joint due to clenching and bruxing, muscle problem, or is it inside the joint, clicking or crepitus or whatever? Because the treatment is completely different. 
You need two different splints depending on the problem. Now here's the thing. Most of us in dental school learn to make the upper night guard or the maxillary flat plane splint. It's a night guard designed, I guess, to prevent you from grinding your teeth. Well, it doesn't prevent you from grinding your teeth because you make holes in it and you, break, you glide through it. So this is not good if you have an external derangement. This is not good if you're clicking. You see, there it is, and you can see the patient's jaw will go back because the acrylic on the upper anterior is, is, is moving the lower jaw back. And there you can see it. You can see the lower jaw is going back on this night guard, as they call it, and that's bad for anybody who clicks. So anybody's clicking, please do not use the night guard. If anybody is clenching and bruxing and they got muscle problems, please don't use this night guard because it actually makes the bruxing worse. So you must be sitting there saying, well, boy, I didn't get a very good education at dental school, and we probably didn't. That's the one I like. Okay, this is a repositioning splint. Okay, these are very popular for people that do a lot of TMJ, and you can see that the upper posterior teeth fit in the grooves. So they're fitting into a groove in a position carefully where the patient does not click. So listen, you make the splint in a position where the patient does not click. You try to recapture the displaced disc. If you do that, a high success rate. Okay, so here's a normal temporomandibular joint, and I want you to look at the at the nerves and blood vessels behind the condyle. So here's a patient biting in centric occlusion. The nerves and blood vessels are between the back of the condyle and the ear, and the disc is in front. And the posterior joint space is larger than the anterior joint space. So you have to have about two and a half millimeters for the disc to fit into, and you can't be compressing the nerves and blood vessels at the back. So here's a condyle that's up and back. When I went to dental school, they told me to move the condyle up and back, rearmost, uppermost position. Well, that's completely wrong because when you compress nerves and blood vessels, you cause a lot of pain, headaches, earaches, neck aches, all kinds of problems. Plus the disc, which you can see marked there, moves forward, and that's called an anterior displaced disc. And when the patient opens, the, the condyle goes over the posterior rim of the disc, and you hear a click. So that's an internal arrangement. So if there's any noise in the joint or intermittent locking or whatever is going on, it's an internal arrangement problem within the joint and you need an anterior repositioning splint, period. Not a flat plane splint and not a night guard. So here's the diagram showing when the patient's biting in centric occlusion, you can see the upper left, the disc is in position. And as they open, upper right, lower right, lower left, the disc stays in position the whole time. And there's no clicking, there's no noise, there's no vibrations. However, when the condyle is back, like the upper left picture, the disc slips in front. Now when the patient goes to open, the, the patient goes onto the disc and that's the click. So when the patient goes onto the disc, there's a click and there's usually a closing click and an opening click. And so that's bad news. That must be fixed before you get what's happening next, which is, which I'll show you in a second. So remember, when the, when the patient is, the disc is anteriorly displaced in centric occlusion, then the condyle goes onto the disc as the patient opens, and that's called at the very bottom of the page there, you can see the photo, stage one and two of internal derangement. Okay, that means disc displacement with reduction. That means you can fix it. That means when the patient is biting in their back teeth, they're clicking when they open, and then you can recapture that disc when you move the jaw forward. So you have to move the jaw down and forward and make the disc in a down and forward, make the splint in a down and forward position. This is really exciting information. Dr. Clifton Simmons, world-renowned clinician and, and author, wrote several articles in which he said to eliminate, if you eliminate the click by moving the jaw down and forward and putting the splint in, you can get rid of 94% of the symptoms. So it's a slam dunk. So if you can if you can find a position where they don't click, please take the bite and make the splint in that position. You're going to be 94% successful. And you're not successful at all with a flat one. Okay? Now this is the patient you don't want to treat. The patient you don't want to treat is a closed lock. So you can see the upper lip photo, the, the disc is in front of the of the head of the condyle. And when the patient opens, it stays in front, stays in front, stays in front. It's never recaptured.
okay? So, so that's at the bottom of the page, it says stage three of internal arrangement means disc displacement without reduction. It means you cannot recapture the disc, don't treat those patients. Send those to someone who specializes in temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. Don't, no general dentist should treat those patients. They're very difficult. And if you don't do anything, you can end up with this. You can end up with a, a crepitus, bone on bone, where, the, where, the, where the, the, the disc is gone, and the ligament is perforated, and it's bone on bone, and it's a mess. But you know what's interesting? Most of the patients are not like this. Most of the patients that come to me are stage two of internal arrangement, and they can be fixed. So here's the five stages of internal arrangement, or disc displacement. The first stage is clicking with no pain. Those patients really can't be treated, because most of those patients will not want you to make them a couple of splints if there's not any pain. Most of them in stage two, where you have more clicking and intermittent locking and pain, those are the ones you got to treat. Okay, so those are the ones I'm going to concentrate on tonight because those are slam dunks. Stage three is jaw locking with severe pain. If you don't treat them in, in stage two, it can lead to jaw locking and severe pain, and then early degenerative osteoarthritis, and then the last one is advanced crepitus. So you don't want three, four, or five. You want to treat the patients in stage two. Again, have we got an external derangement, clenching and bruxing or occlusal problems? Let's make the diagnosis. I have an article here I will send you. If you just, uh, we'll tell you how to get it later. But um, in this article, I wrote only three pages. It's very easy. I think I hand that out to my TMD patients. But it says there 34% of the population has TMD. And yet, very few dental schools are teaching patients to, do, to, to, to be treated. Dentists are having no training, and MDs are getting no training. So the poor patients, they have to go find some dentists, and just a few of them, that are treating these patients. But really, all general dentists should be treating patients in stage two of internal arrangement, using a repositioning splint, as I showed you. This is really interesting. A friend of mine looked up some of the medical textbooks, and he saw after 1980, the, the, the uh, medical the medical doctors removed TM joint from the medical textbooks. So for 36 years, it's been out of the textbooks. Now it's in our med dental textbooks, but it's not taught in the dental school. So it's 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 just it's a real problem for patients with the problem. I can tell you, and 36% of the population have it. So again, clenching and bruxing, we have to stop that habit at night. If you're clenching and bruxing at night, you're wearing down your teeth, and you're really overworking your muscles and your muscles are going to get a spasm and it's causing pain okay so what you have to do the temporalis muscle and the master muscle are two of the main closing muscles okay they close the muscles to close them out and when the patient clenches they're the ones that get sore so we palpate those muscles and we can see where the soreness is okay and and you need to stop that clenching and bruxing at night now this is another patient who came to me from another dentist wearing an upper bruxing appliance. And of course, as I showed you, the jaw usually goes back and makes it worse. And here's a case where they said in 1995 they made three million of these all across the United States. And do you really think it's stopping bruxing when the patient's making holes in the appliance? I mean, they're biting through. Look how hard that plastic is and look at those marks. I mean that patient just grinding on that thing all night. It's certainly not preventing bruxing and it's certainly not good for the muscles when they go in spasm all night and the patient will frequently wake up with headaches. So make note of that. If the patient has an appliance and they're making holes in it and they're waking up with headaches, you better get that appliance out and I'll show you which one I use. Okay. Also it can be very serious because it can cause those appliances can cause sleep apnea and snoring. So apnea is when you stop breathing for 10 seconds or more. Hypopnea means your oxygen goes down 4% or more in the blood. And if you have mild sleep apnea, you're stopping breathing 5 to 15 times an hour. Moderate is 16 to 30, and severe is over 30. The reason I'm mentioning that is this article came out and shows that the use of occlusal flat plane splints in patients with sleep apnea, they get 50% worse. So you could be actually slowly ruining the health of your patient by using these appliances if the patient has sleep apnea. And also it increases snoring by 40%. So you're, you, you shouldn't use them in 
patients with Brox. You shouldn't use them in patients who click. You shouldn't use them in snoring patients, and you shouldn't use them in patients who have sleep apnea. So you shouldn't use them. Sleep apnea is when the patient lies in their back and their tongue falls back and blocks the airway for 10 seconds or more. And there's a huge correlation between cardiovascular disease and sleep apnea. And you don't want to make your patients worse. So don't use these splints on patients who have apnea. Here's 450 articles that relate cardiovascular disease and heart attacks and strokes to sleep apnea. I can send you that article if you're interested. So there it says, don't use flat plane splints in patients who snore if they sleep apnea. Again, that's what you want to use, the repositioning splint, okay? Remember, take the bite in a position where they don't click. And make your, take your bite registration in that position. I'll show you a couple of bites, I'll show you what to do. And just have that an index split. Don't have it flat. Have the upper teeth fitting into the grooves so the patient only bites in one position. Okay? So the repositioning splint can help snoring, sleep apnea, and also help TM disorders. That's what you want to use. So remember, internal arrangement is clicking, intermittent locking. That's the splint you want to use. And that's my number if you need to any information, any courses or anything I can help you with or if you need any anything you see tonight that you want me to help you with, any forms, any articles, we'd be happy to send them to you. So in March of 2016, this year, I got 60 new patients in one month. 33 ortho patients, 17 TMD patients, 10 sleep patients. And off a site, I would say we're halfway responsible for that because I have a lot of people that look at my website. I had one today that came in because she she looked up TMD or ortho or sleep, whatever it was, and she was a TMD patient. And then she came. She said, I like website. It was well organized. You showed your credentials. Um, you had a video on there I watched, and uh, here I am. So again, office site, thank you very much. Oh, Tracy. Thank you for the kind words, Dr. Rondo. We appreciate that. That's really what we love to hear and really speaks to our mission at Office Site. We want to help all dentists succeed with an effective online presence. So with that said, I just wanted to give a quick tour and show you all quickly what type of program Dr. Rondo is set up with and then and then we'll get you back to the presentation. And so the whole reason Office Site is around is to help dentists succeed online. We have a really simple platform and make everything really dentist friendly. Um, we help manage your search engine optimization. So, um, you know, search engines like Google know who you are, rank you higher. Um, we help manage your online reputation and those uh, patient reviews, your social media. Um, we also include patient education on your website. Uh, a lot of tools that we help you to leverage to make your online presence effective, all while leveraging the latest trends. So, with that said, I want to professionally follow up with anybody who's interested in their own website evaluation. So if you'll please go ahead and answer this quick poll here. Would you, you know, if you would like an, uh, if you'd like Office Site to provide you with a free online effectiveness evaluation, um, we can go ahead and do that for you. And I just want to make sure we do this, um, you know, respectfully and professionally. So just go ahead and answer yes or no, and we can get to that. Um, I can set up an appointment with you later on tonight or tomorrow. Um, and you know, show you what, what you can do and how you can improve your web presence. So we have about 57 who voted, 57%. Give another couple seconds. And 71%. Okay, I'm going to close this and I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. Rondo and get back to the presentation. And uh, and we'll we'll get to more as we get to the presentation. Highly recommend that y'all do that. I mean, they are really a professional organization. And and the, the one thing that you really got me onto was the um, the smartphones and how important uh, the smartphones are now because the cell phones. Everybody's going on their cell phone to get all their information now, and so you have to have your website uh, sized properly so it fits on your smartphone or patients won't watch it. So if the, if the print is too near, too small, it won't work it. And, and Google won't rate you if you haven't got a proper cell phone and a proper website that goes with the cell phone. So that's one thing you did for me a couple of years ago, and it's really helped because it, you, more people are on their cell phones now than on the computers. And that's that's a tremendous th th thing that you've done. But you're always way ahead. You you work with Google. You go down. You train with Google, and you and you know what Google are doing. And Google work with you. And so it's 
I mean, really highly recommend your company. And you come to all my courses, and you've been coming to my courses for the last 15 years. And no dentist has ever taken your my advice to go with you has ever phoned me up and said they were disappointed. So that's why I, you're always welcome in my courses. So uh, well, thank you very much. We appreciate that. That's an unpaid yeah. political announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so it's true. I don't say anything's not true. So team dysfunction. Here's a patient, obviously in a lot of pain, right? So the first thing I do to diagnose TMD, and I want you to think about this, all of you. If you have a patient that comes in and they don't look that happy, how are you going to know? Are you just going to tell them to open their mouth and check their teeth and gums, which we've been trained to do as general dentists, or are you going to look at the whole patient? And I'm going to recommend that you take a TMJ health questionnaire and fill it out on every patient. Also take out a ruler and measure their range of motion and muscle palpations. We can teach that in a course or you can read about it, but at least do the first two. So here's a patient that will be very surprising to a lot of you, and it was to me, when you see a patient with a pretty good occlusion, you wonder how could you possibly have temporomandibular joint dysfunction. But I want you to pay attention to the overbite, and I can tell you that 85% of females over age 20 that have a deep overbite have the potential to have a TMD problem. Huge numbers. So they're all in your practice. It's loaded with them. Okay? And these patients don't know where to go. These patients, remember, there's only 34% of the population have it, and a small, small percentage of dentists study and treat these TMD patients properly. Short lower face height. And there's my initial examination reports. They come in and they meet with my staff first who've been properly trained to, to examine and talk to patients and they meet with the patient for about um, three quarters of an hour before I even come in the room. So her chief complaint is jaw pain. She had a night guard a year ago which didn't work and I and you know why because the jaw is going back it's not going forward and it needs to go forward. The symptoms are worse in the morning which means she's clenching all night. Remember I told you if she's got headaches or symptoms in the morning she's clenching and grinding and she is. She's got daily headaches. Daily headaches. How would you like to have, at 20 years old, have daily headaches every day? Takes Tylenol daily and a jaw locks monthly. I mean, what kind of a life has she got and who's going to help her? And here's the TMJ health question form I'm going to encourage all of you to get. If you, if you call our office or, or email our office, we will certainly email that to you. And I would recommend you, you use that in every patient. Very briefly, if you answer yes to all those questions, you're in trouble. If you answer no to everything, you're good. But look at she's got ear pain, stuffiness in the ears, ring in the ears, headaches, front of head, clenching, bruxing, clicking jaw. So when you see clenching and bruxing, you're going to wear a special appliance at night to stop that. When you're clicking, you're going to use the repositioning splint that I showed you. That's indexed. Pain behind the eye, jaw pain. Okay. Daily, again, daily headaches, migraines, neck pain. Jaw is tired upon awakening. Teeth sore upon awakening. That means she's grinding all night. She had extractive wisdom teeth, which probably aggravated the situation, and dizziness. So please, if you do nothing else at all for me or for your practice, get that TMJ health questionnaire form and give it to every single patient that comes to your office, every recall patient, every new patient, so you will know whether they have an existing temporomandibular joint problem. If they have one, and you don't want to treat it, then that's okay. Google TMD in your area and find a dentist that likes treating these patients. Or you can take the course, mine or some other course. I have a two-day course on this, and I can make you pretty comfortable in two days of what you're doing. And, um, and there's lots of other courses out there you can take. But that's something I think all of you should, because we didn't learn in dental school, I think it's something we need to learn after dental school. Range of motion, very important. So get out a ruler and, and and measure how much she can open. Well, she can open 50 millimeters, which is normal. She can go to the right, 11, normal. Left, 11, normal. Protrusive, 9. Everything's normal. So a range of motion is normal, but you're going to find a lot of your patients with temporal mandibular joint dysfunction don't have normal range of motion. So what are the signs of team, team dysfunction? Clenching is one of the signs. Aggravates a muscle mastication. Remember the temporalis of the masseter and pain upon awakening. Now, we palpate the muscles. We teach you how to do that in the course. That's uh, not spelled correctly. Um, anyway, you can see it says here that severe pain is three. 
and look at all the threes. Look at look at your chart and look at all the threes. I mean, she's in intense pain. Everywhere I touched her, she ached and went out, joke, joke. The temporal is the master, and all these muscles were hurting a lot due to clenching and also the jaw being in the wrong position. Okay, so sore muscles indicate a problem. You could either be to the condyles too far back and the disc anteriorly displaced, or it could be due to extra capsular problems like clenching and bruxing. So all of those things can cause muscle problems. And she was she was treated with a night guard. Okay, I mean, I, I probably, 70% of the patients that come to me with temporal mandibular joint dysfunction come with a night guard that distalize their jaw five millimeters. So whether it's the top or the bottom, it doesn't matter, but that distalize your jaw five millimeters. And I we tried to explain to you, you've got to move the condyle down and forward, not up and back. And so she got no relief from this. There it is, flat. It's a skating rink. Your teeth just your jaw just goes back on that. So again, no relief of symptoms. Okay? And I feel sorry for the dentist because we were all trained to do this. We were all trained to put a flat plane night guard in everybody, regardless of whether they're clenching or bruxing or clicking or wearing their teeth down or whatever, everybody gets a night guard and they don't work. Now there's some x-rays. Now you won't have to take these x-rays if you're going to treat these patients, but I have a tomogram machine in my office, so I take the x-rays and you can look at the condyle, see on the right side there, on the right hand side, and can you see the posterior joint space is smaller than the anterior joint space? There's no room for a disc up there. Remember, the disc is only two and a half millimeters thick. So those condyles are too far back and the disc is displaced anteriorly. And there it is. So posteriorly spaced condyle, I showed you, impinges on the nerves and blood vessels behind the condyle. When you reposition the condyle downward and forward, you reduce the signs and symptoms of DM dysfunction. It's so easy. It's all you have to do is move the condyle down and forward by increasing the vertical and moving it forward on a re, on an index splint. You want to move it away from this area. Is that pays in a lot of pain? Move it to here, downward and forward. So there's four to five millimeters for the nerves and blood vessels, and you got a two and a half millimeters for the disc. I mean, I hate to tell you. It's not simple, but it's simple. You have to get the condyle in the correct position in the fossa if you want to fix these patients. It's, it's, you have to do that. If you don't do that, it's a structural problem. I know there's a lot of people treating with drugs and psychological counseling and biofeedback and all kinds of things, and really it's a structural problem if you're clicking. Move the jaw to the correct position and recapture the disc, period. Okay, we also have a device in our office called a joint vibration analysis, which again, you don't have to have when you start out. If you get into this big time, I would recommend you get it because it's fantastic. It tells you exactly what's going on with each temporomandibular joint. So we have them open and closed, and the average um, opening or uh, vibration or noise on the left was 16, and the average on the right was 15, and it comes out to be um, mild degenerative joint disease on one side. So one side's got mild degenerative joint disease. Now this is um, an informed consent agreement which you could send you um, if you want it, but you've got a copy here, but if you want us to email you a copy, we'd be happy to do it. You have to go over an informed consent agreement before you put in the splints. And you see it says here she's going to get the lower splint to wear during the daytime and the lower teeth to try and stop the clicking and reduce the pain. She's going to get an upper splint to wear at night to prevent the clenching and bruxing. It's going to get laser treatments, which is a warm light that helps eliminate the sore muscles and trigger points. Again, you don't have to have that equipment when you start. If you put the jaw in the right position, the, the pain will eventually go away. I get her to list all her symptoms there. So all her, when she checked all those things off, she checked off those that was bothering her. The next page I say, look, locked jaw is very painful and should be avoided. So please get some treatment done before your jaw locks. Side effects, we don't have a lot of side effects. Most of the patients, especially when you can recapture the disc and stop the clicking, stop the clenching at night, they get better without drugs. I don't have to use I don't have to use a lot of drugs. I mean, I, I prescribe very few drugs. I, mean, I'm, I, I just get them in, get the jaw in the right position and stop the habits. But once in a while, we do need chiropractors if there's a neck problem or medical doctors or ear, nose, and throat specialists, and we discuss that in the course. 
laser treatments, that warm light is, 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 is good, but you don't have to have that. I treated for many years without the laser. It just speeds up the treatment a little bit for me now. Down below, the patient gets two splints. And the thing that you have to explain to them, and this is very important, is look at the, look at the picture in the upper right, and that's the patient biting in centric occlusion at the beginning of treatment. The patient middle right is uh, the patient wearing the splint. And the bottom page that's marked, bottom right, is what happens when the patient wears the splint for three or four months. They end up with a posterior open bite. Now, this is extremely important. That posterior open bite is caused by the condom moving down and forward and wanting to stay there and doesn't want to go back to the painful position where they're compressing the nerves and blood vessels. And it's not due to intruding the teeth. It's due to a repositioning of the condom down and forward. Okay, so this patient is going to pay me 3700 in advance or 4200 over time. And they, when they understand what's going on and you show them, they're more than willing to go for treatment. Okay, again, is it an internal arrangement? Yes, it is. She was clicking and you, you saw that. She was clicking and, and also she had vibrations in her joint, which we picked up with a joint vibration analysis. So here she is with a class 1 molar. Now, you need to understand this. Okay, so when you're biting in your back teeth like this, patient's biting in their back teeth, okay? They're biting their back teeth, the condyle is back in some cases, and the disc in front, okay? So you can look at the posterior teeth on the diagram they're touching, and you've got a deep bite in the front. So you've got a deep bite in the front, your posterior teeth are good, but the, but the disc is dislocated. So then you put in your splint, okay? You put in your splint. Index splint, it's got three ball class on each side. I must mention that the splint only covers the two bicuspids in the first molar. It doesn't cover the second molar. You want the second molar to passively erupt and open up the bite. So now when you move the jaw forward and you put your splint in, now the posterior teeth aren't right, the front teeth are right, and the, and the jaw's in the right position. So you tell the patient, look, we, we had two problems before, and now we've got one. Now our only problem is to try and figure out what to do with that space between the back teeth. The patient can stay wearing the splint if they want, or they can go to orthodontics, or they can have crown and bridge, or they can have an overlay partial. So again, that's the article that I will send you if you contact Lee, and it shows on the lower left the repositioning splint, and it shows on the lower right my anterior deprogrammer, which I'm going to show you in a minute. That's what they wear at night to stop the clenching and proxy. And notice, no posterior contact or teeth. If your posterior teeth touch, you're going to clench. The posterior teeth don't touch, you won't clench. You won't be able to activate your master and your temporalis muscle if your posterior teeth don't touch. And that's what you want to do. And that just summarizes the five stages of internal arrangement. That's in the article. And that's the flat plane night guard that I don't like. That really is, it moves the mandible back. It's bad for TMJ. If you're clicking, it actually can cause a closed lock. I've got patients who are clicking, and they come to me with their jaw locked because the dentist put in a night guard. And it's too bad because in dental school, they sure don't tell you that. Okay, so my, my course is, is online, and you can take it. It's 20 CE credits, 20 hours, and it's a lot of different cases and, and a lot more detail than I'm trying to give you tonight. I'm trying to talk as fast as I can to give you as much information as I can in the hour. But I'm really trying to stimulate you to want to learn more about TMJ, whether you learn from me or someone else. I really think the dentist of today needs to learn more about this to help with their patients. And don't be afraid. I think that they made it sound in dental school that we couldn't do it. And maybe you couldn't do it because you're using flat plane splints. So we're going to take $400 off if you sign up uh, for the course in the near future. Now, here's what you do. When a patient comes to your office, first of all, put your fingers in their ears or just in front of their ears and have them open and close. So it's, that's not showing here. Have them open and close and feel the click. Now, the next step is to put a tongue depressor between the teeth and have them open and close again. Try to find a position where they don't click. Sometimes they have to use two tongue depressors. Sometimes they have to move their jaw a little more forward. But if they got an overjet or an overbite, this is what you do. Try to find with the tongue depressors the position where they don't click, okay? So just put your fingers either in the ear or just in front of the ear. 
and have them open and close and try to find the position where they don't click okay remember I told you before if you can eliminate the click you get rid of 94 percent of the symptoms I mean that's a pretty good percentage that's a pretty high percentage and that's a better percentage than anybody who gives drugs or biofeedback or or treats depression it's a it's a structural problem the internal derangement is a structural problem you need to relocate the jaw forward and recapture the disc the clenching and bruxing is a muscle problem you've got to make sure the temporalis and masters don't touch so again move her lower jaw forward she's looking in a mirror and moving her jaw forward she's with one hand she's holding the mirror with the other hand she's holding the stick if you don't hold the stick when she opens the clothes it'll come out of the mouth and then I also show her okay it's perfect we got rid of the click I want you to look in the picture and you see that space between your back teeth we have to put plastic over your back teeth and that's going to fix you and I can tell them I mean, you could almost give them a money-back guarantee if you can recapture the disc that you're going to eliminate their signs and symptoms of temporal temporal mandibular joint disorder it's phenomenal so there's the bite so we find that position this is another patient and we put triad to hold the position to make sure everything's okay the splint should be two at least two millimeters thick in the back and remember they've already established in that particular position she's not clicking okay in that position she's not clicking and so we put the triad on to make sure it's a comfortable position and then if she says I'm okay it doesn't hurt then we inject with polyvinyl siloxane so inject with polyvinyl siloxane uh, and the triad and send the triad and the polyvinyl siloxane to the lab and they'll make the splint for you okay so there's various devices to, to, to take the bite and we're not going to go into it in great detail here I will do that in the course um, but there's the splint so it's got a gel bar it's got two bicuspids in a molar very small they can talk with it they can eat with it it's indexed so they can chew their food and there it is it's very comfortable lots of room for the tongue doesn't interfere with their speech and there it is it's indexed right they can't move to a different position they have to bite in that exact position and remember that exact position is where they don't click and then there's the there's the tomograms before and there's the tomograms after look at how much that condyle moved down and forward so that's a good position so there's before on the left and there's with the splint on the right again you don't have to have tomograms when you start out please don't think you need those not when you start out just start out by finding a position where they don't click period okay so let's see we're going to take a bite now for the night appliance you haven't seen one yet now I've got a, a lab called uh, five star ortho in Dallas and they've come up with this new McKenzie gauge bite registration which I just love um, you can go forward or back eight millimeters and you can go up or down vertically eight millimeters by putting those various little parts in there and I just love it and I use it for all my bite registrations now it just came out about a year ago and so there it is and they bite into little grooves again I can show you how to use that in, in, in the future or you can call five star ortho in Dallas and that's the number in the bottom of the screen and uh, and and order those but they're fantastic I mean they're the best things for doing any kind of bites with any any appliance you want to use so there's my Ferrari I call it a Ferrari night appliance as my anterior deprogrammer only the front teeth touch that that ramp and the back teeth is open at the back you don't want any contact of cuspids bicuspids or molars only the lower incisors and there's a ramp on there remember the big deal is keep the jaw forward so that ramp keeps the lower jaw forward at night and there's a hole in it so the patient can breathe if they get a cold and these are very very comfortable the patients love them they just go in at night and they go to sleep and they wake up in the morning they don't have any headaches they're not grinding their teeth and it really works on the muscles this is a muscle deal this this will not increase bruxing it'll reduce bruxing so there it is very comfortable so no contraction of masters or temporalis so therefore no headaches I mean it's such a simple solution and and five-star ortho in Dallas um, make those so again not every lab knows how to make the Ferrari and not every lab knows how to make the exact repositioning splint I use so highly recommend that lab so there it is that's the Ferrari night appliance okay with the ramp and the, and the, and the hole in it and the ball class Polling question number one. What have you got, Tracy? 
Yes, let me go ahead and start that up. So we got um, patients who click when they open and close in centric occlusion should be given an upper night guard to wear at night, true or false. So we got some people starting to vote, about, uh, about uh, half, 60% in. So I'll give it a couple more seconds to get some more people in there. About 80%, and then we'll go ahead and share those results. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share that with everybody. So you can see there what everybody answered. We got about 82% that said false. And that's the right answer. Perfect, perfect. So I will go ahead and that, good. get back to, move back to there, there. All right. That's great. Okay, so for a copy of this article, which which I'd be happy to send you, we can we can email that to you. Just go Lee at Rondoseminars.com, L E E at Rondoseminars.com, and we'll send you that article. There's page one, there's page two, and there's page three. Happy to send it to you. Okay, so that was published a year ago, and we talked about the internet course. And um, there's the night appliance again. There's the day appliance. Now let me make something clear. If the patient comes in and they have an internal derangement, if their jaw is clicking, they need a day and a night appliance. Okay? That's very important. Because if you just make them the day appliance and put that in at night, they'll clench on that. Do so you understand? If they're clicking, then you have to give them two. You have to give them the day and the night. On the other hand, if they come in and the patient is not clicking and they just have sore muscles, and their teeth are worn down, and they're bruxing and clenching, they just need the Ferrari. So not everybody needs two, just the clickers. But if they're just clenching and bruxing, make them just the Ferrari. Okay, that's very important. You gotta make the right diagnosis and pick the right treatment plan. So remember I told you, when you wear the splint, you'll get a posterior open bite. That's normal. If you don't see that, then it's not working. If they're, if they're not wearing their splint, they won't get a posterior open bite. If their jaw is not recaptured, they won't get a posterior open bite. They have to get that posterior open bite. Okay? That's normal. So when you wear the splint, you wear that for three or four months, you're going to get that posterior open bite. Look for it. Now remember, I didn't cover the second molar. And I'm hoping in that four or five months that the second molar will passively erupt and open up the bite. So I do that on purpose. I only cover the two bicuspids and the first molar. Then I have to give them progress reports, and we can send you copies of these if you want. So in January, she's four to five, five being the best, no pain medication. She was on all kinds of pain medications daily before. She believes my therapy is helping her, and she's had six months of treatment, and she wants to talk about maybe going to phase two. She had a 90% improvement. She's still got mild ear pain, mild fatigue, mild jaw pain, but and a few headaches, but nothing like every day. So that's the success. 80, 70, 90% is pretty successful. I'm pretty happy with that. So then we take some pictures, and again we show her with the splint in that in that right hand picture on the, on the right hand side, the middle, and then the open bite on the bottom. And then we do. Remember, she had mild degenerative joint disease in one of her joint joint joints when we started, and then we do another joint vibration analysis and prove that she's normal, so she has no problems. So we took her from a noisy joint of 16 and 15 to a quieter joint of 5 and 5. So that's good. So we've reduced the noise in her joint by recapturing her disc and proved it with the joint vibration analysis. But you wouldn't have to use this. All you have to do is put your fingers in her ears to see if she clicks. So all you need to get started is, is a ruler and, and, and examine the joint and use your TMJ health questionnaire. So there's the condyl down and forward with the splint, and there she was before, and there she is after. Now that's before we do the second stage. Okay, so she's much happier, and uh, we do have a course coming up in Chicago. So I got an excellent two-day course on TMD on the 20th and 21st, and you'd all be very welcome to attend. The fee is 10.95, but by by coming on board tonight and, and listening to me for an hour, I'll give you a little discount of 300. So the fee would be $7.95. I highly recommend you bring your staff too, and we can make a good deal for your staff. 
but that's a really good course, and this manual is unbelievable. I mean, I'm known for my course manuals, and this is 300 pages. And if you go to that course for two days, and you get that manual, and that's included in the fee, uh, I, I can guarantee you, you will be doing, you'll be making these two splints for a lot of patients, and knowing what to do, and knowing and, and, and feeling very confident because we'll spend a lot of time showing how to palpate the muscles and do the range of motion. We're showing a number of cases and um, and I think you'll feel pretty happy after that course uh, in, in, in tackling some of these patients. So love to see you. So I then charge her 6500 for case finishing. Okay, so the next thing we have to do is try to finish the case. So a lot of my patients like the clear brackets. So we put clear brackets on the upper front teeth. And then we're going to start erupting the teeth. See, look at the molar. The second molar has come up. So remember, the splint only covered the two bicuspids in the first molar, but the second molar has come up on its own in, in about six months. So we don't have to bring that up. It's already up. All we have to do now is, is, is put those teeth together. Okay, so the splint's a temporary solution, and erupting the teeth is a permanent solution. So now we're going to erupt those teeth. Okay, polling question number two. Tracy? Yes. Let me, yep. Yeah, sorry, got the, the little, little delay there. The uh, next polling question we have is um, patients who brux or grind their teeth at night should wear an interior uh, deprogrammer known as the Ferrari appliance. True or false? So looks like we got um, about 60% voted. Again, we'll give a couple more seconds to get the last few people a uh, chance to vote on their answer. And we got about 86%. So I'll go ahead and share those results then. And it looks like everybody um, answered true. Wow. Very smart group here we have tonight. Excellent. I'm really happy about that. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. So go ahead. Okay. So, so we're going to, the patient probably got into a little bit of symptoms. And so I relined it with triad, just increased the vertical a little bit. And so we put that on temporarily to help the vertical. And look at the indexing going on in the occlusal surface there. So again, realign with triad if, if we need to do it. And there's kind of the patient happy afterwards. And that's it. So now I'm going to show you the next case is we're going to show you how to finish it, OK? So Jessica, it's kind of sad. She had ortho done. So she's 20 years old, and she's a post-ortho case. It doesn't matter who did it. It doesn't matter who did it. Somebody treated her, and, and she finished with a class 2 molar and a class 2 cuspid. Okay? You're not supposed to finish with that. You're supposed to finish class 1. And she's got an overjet of 4. So her jaw's gone back. Now, I don't know whether she was treated with class 2 elastics and she relapsed or what, but there she is. And there she is on that side. Class 2 molar, class 2 cuspid. All I know is she's in a lot of pain. Okay, and she was given a night guard also. Another patient given a night guard. Okay, it was interesting. Today a patient came in and I said, how'd you end up here? She said, I had ortho done and um, I got in problems afterwards. I went to my orthodontist and he said, go find your general dentist and find out who to go to. It's a TMJ problem and I don't treat TMJ. So, so that was a different patient than this one, but I mean, it's kind of interesting. Um, I think all of us have to have somebody that we can send the patient with TMJ problems to. And hopefully you'll learn how to do it yourself and help some of these patients and maybe fill up your appointment book because our appointment books are, now my appointment books are pretty full, but I have a number of general dentists I work with because I own a part, I own a general practice also as well as my ortho practice. And I can tell you that some months, there's some openings in those schedules, and it's um, it's getting very competitive out there, and you all know that. But obviously, you're the cream of the crop because you're on the you're on tonight listening and trying to improve yourself. So, congratulations for taking the time to do it. I'm glad you're here. So the night appliance is not working. The night appliance had worked; she wouldn't be in my office, right? And the night appliance gives her an overjet of about three millimeters. So post ortho case four years ago. So at 16, she was treated. Then someone made her a lower night guard, made the clicking worse, and she ends up in my office. And there's the TMJ health questionnaire form. Again, I mean, this is sad. This is after ortho. First of all, her occlusion is terrible. 
Then they gave her a night guard, which made her worse. And now she's wandering around trying to figure out who's going to help her. Probably going to her physician getting pills for pain. Maybe going to the chiropractor to get her neck adjusted. And maybe going to someone for psychological counseling. Who knows? It's just a neurologist to get a, to get a CT scan of the brain. She's got a tumor. I mean, on and on and on and on. And really, she needs someone like you or I who are put that jaw in the right position. So here she's got headaches, neck aches, clenching and bruxing. So she's grinding her teeth at night, clicking jaw. So again, what's, and jaw, jaw locking. She needs two splints, right? She needs a splint at night for the clenching and bruxing. And she needs a, a repositioning splint for the day for the clicking. I mean, come on. It's easy just from the TMJ Health Quest Airport. But look at this. This is one of the loudest temperamentally rejoiced I've ever seen in my entire life. Her noise level is 782. It's called Displacement with Reduction and Mild Degenerative Joint Disease. That's the JVA showing that. And the other side is like out of the park. It's, it's 1,061, the noise level. I mean, it's unbelievable. But look, it says Displacement with Reduction, which means we can fix it. Okay? We can fix it. We hope the number will be less than 20, and she's a 1,000. So we do a phonetic bite. The phonetic bite means our bite registration. So we take a bite registration, okay? And before we did it, I would have her bite up and down on that blue blue, uh, blue thing, blue, blue uh, bite block, and see whether or not we could reduce the noise in her joint. So I'd have her bite up and down on the blue block before we take the bite. Okay, and then I'll show you what we did, and then we do the bite. Okay, so put the triad and the polyvinyl siloxane to take the bite. But when she just bit up and down on that blue bite stick, okay, which simulates my bite, her left joint went to 6.8. Okay, so the treatment success is proven ahead of time with a joint vibration analysis. Now, if you don't have that, Remember, just put your fingers in the ears or just in front of the ears and see if she's still clicking. Okay? So don't make the splint if she's still clicking. Make the splint in a position where she's not clicking. Right? Okay. So remember, on the left temporomandibular joint, before treatment, biting up and down her back teeth, just biting up and down center occlusion where the orthodontic clinician left her, she had a noise level of 782. When I did the bite and moved her jaw forward a little bit and opened the vertical, it went to 6.8, which is normal. And the other side, remember, is crazy. I mean, it's 1,061. I mean, the noisiest joint I have in my practice. I've never had one noisier than that. And again, when we did the bite registration, moved her jaw slightly forward. Remember, she had a 4 millimeter overjet. And moved her to class 1 and opened the vertical a couple of minutes to the front. The right joint went to 6.3. I mean, unbelievable. So I know ahead of time it's going to work. So you could know ahead of time it's going to work. If, remember, 94% of the symptoms go away if you make it where they don't click. So there's the repositioning splint. So again, it only covers the two bicuspids and the first molar. Second molar is free to erupt at the back. Okay, we over-open them a bit at the beginning, and then we can slowly close them down and still make sure the clicking doesn't work. It stays the same. And there's the Ferrari for night. And the repositioning for the day. So there's the repositioning of the day because she was clicking. And there's the Ferrari at night because she was clenching. So there's the Ferrari. Make sure only the four incisors hit. It looks like we have to adjust that a little bit. Sometimes, sometimes my staff will take the photo before I come in the room. I come in and put some articulating paper and adjust that. So all four teeth are hitting evenly. No posterior teeth touching and no cuspid touching. Okay. Repositioning split day. And now we're going to put the brackets on. We put the brackets on and rub these teeth one at a time. Okay, so there's the, it looks like the second molar hadn't quite contacted on that side, so we put elastic going from two hooks on the top to a, a bracket on the lower. So just erupt that teeth, that tooth first, leaving the splint in to support the jaw. Okay, go take the splint out, you'll lose position. You leave the splint in a whole position. Okay, so the splint stays in the whole position and you erupt second molar on both sides. And we like to go two teeth on the top versus one on the bottom. Okay? So that's a rectangular wire in the upper, which is very strong and holds the vertical. So there you can see now the second molar is touching. 
and we've got a little separator there between the first and second molars which will take out and that separator will come out and that will speed up the eruption of the second molar and the first molar. Okay, so now the second molar has erupted. Okay, there's a bracket on there you can't see but the second molar is touching. Okay, and make sure the vertical is closed a little bit, make sure she's not clicking and make sure she's not in any discomfort. And she was okay. Okay, so now we're going to grind off the first molar. So now we took off the first molar. So grind the plastic above the first molar and now we're going to bring that up. So put a bracket on that too. So now your elastic should be going to the first and second molars and usually two brackets on the top versus one on the bottom. Triangular elastic. So there you can see. So we've gone from the second bicuspid and first molar in the upper to the first molar in the lower. And that might take three months to bring up. So if your patient's out of town, you can tell them, look, don't come until those teeth are touching. So you have to come every month. Just wear your elastics. And we'll see you in two or three months. And the other thing that's interesting is that you would think that the teeth would extrude out of the bone, but they don't. The bone comes up with the tooth. So the teeth do not get longer. You know, the alveolar process comes up. The alveolar bone remodels and up come the teeth. And there you can see now the first molar is touching almost and the second molar is touching. Okay. As soon as we have the first and second molars touching on both sides, we can then take the splint out and put the brackets on. Okay. And we're still working on that first and second molar to get them to touch. But you can see, let's go back here and look at that space. Look at that big space between the, the molar, first molar and the upper and lower first molars. That's about what? Three or four millimeters. And then the patient wears the elastic and sure enough it comes up. And the tooth is not any longer. It's still the same length. The crown's still the same length. Okay, and the other side this looks good. And when that's touching, make sure you keep the elastics on for three or four months after it touches to prevent a relapse. Okay, the elastic can't take them off. You got to keep those elastics on all the time. They only take the elastics out to eat. Okay, and now the molars are touching. And now we're almost ready to take the split out and put all the brackets on the lower. There we go. Now once the molars are touching, keep the elastics on the molars, put your brackets on, and bring up the bicuspids. So all we have to do now is start bringing up the bicuspids. So now we're bringing up the bicuspids. So I've got elastics going to the first, first molars, and i got elastics going to the second bicuspids. And that's it. I mean, this is really simple. Remember, she's paying me 6500 and I already know the position is correct. I already know she's pain free in, in phase one and so I'm just doing phase two but I mean this is so easy. I mean we're using an, an arch wire in the lower which is a round wire which is, which is, which is easy and, and very flexible and the one on the top is a rectangular wire providing good anchorage so the lower teeth won't come down. We want the, want the lower teeth to come up and not the upper teeth to come down. And again, we should have changed those ligature ties. She would have looked a lot better and probably brushed her teeth a little bit. But anyway, she's looking good. So just wear those elastics and bring those teeth up. I mean, you have, you know, we got a permanent solution. You can see that those bicuspids are not any longer. The crown length is exactly the same as before. They haven't extruded out of the bone. The alveolar process came up. I mean, it's really simple. It's painless. You're bringing them up in, in two or three months. It's not something that happens overnight. And she looks pretty good. I mean, pretty simple. I mean, it's and it's a fantastic service for patients because now she's going to be finished and she'll never need any other treatment. The reason she relapsed, in my opinion, is because the condyle was in the wrong position in the fossa at the end of treatment and she relapsed. She had an unstable jaw joint and it's going to cause instability to her bite. And so she, she, her jaw wasn't normal. Now I'm going to have good occlusion. See, I've got class one molar, class one cuspid, normal overjet overbite. And because I've got the condyle in the correct position in the fossa, it will not relapse. And that's the thing we have to get through our heads that if you are working on a patient who's clicking and you do crown and bridge or you do anything, you're going to be, you're going to have a problem. You put the crown and bridge on and they're clicking, they're going to break those crowns due to closal interferences and, and try to get the jaw to a comfortable position. So you really do 
have to hopefully think I'm right in that try to stabilize the temporal mandibular joint before you do ortho, before you do crown and bridge, before you do dentures. I mean, get the jaw in the right position. Okay? We're almost done. But you can see it was a really simple case. I mean, that's probably six months later. Well, maybe, maybe nine months later. Probably nine months later to, to get all those teeth touching. But very little work on my part. Just tell the patient, wear elastics. We'll grind this off. We'll bring this tooth up. Now we'll grind the next one. Bring that up. And there she is. I mean, the bite's closed seven months. It took seven months to close the bite. Seven months, not nine months. So there she was with an open bite. And there she is, seven months later with the bite closed. Now we'll keep those elastics on to make sure the teeth don't go back down and make sure she makes all her payments. And we're all set. But I mean, it's really neat to take a patient who was treated previously orthodontically to an incorrect position, 20 years old, with all those headaches and neck aches and back aches and all the problems she had, and put a splint in for four months, okay, four or five months, get her stabilized, get her happy, and then say to her, okay, let's do the races. And as you can see, I was well compensated. I was paid 3700 for the payment advance for the two splints, and I was paid 6500 for the ortho, and she's happy, and she appreciates it. So again, um, I really enjoy doing this. I really enjoy helping patients, and I'm hoping that I've stimulated some of you to think about this and shown you that it's not that difficult. We can definitely teach you to do this, and we show you how to do this in the in the courses, and or take some other courses. But really, I'm hoping I'm stimulating you to to want to learn more, because it's something we all should have been taught in dental school. And I'm so glad I took some courses after I graduated to learn how to do this, so I could help more patients. So again, we're done. And uh, more information, you can look at my website. You can call that number on the screen. And I guess I'd, I would encourage you to, to think about it. And I'm really happy you came tonight. I really appreciate the fact that you gave one hour of your life to, to listen to me. And hopefully you've gleaned enough information that it will help you and your patients in the future. So I wish you all the best. And, and office site, thank you very much, Tracy, for, for sponsoring this. And, and um, I, I think it's a credit to your organization that you're not just trying to trying to get everybody to go with your company for the websites, but you're helping with the education of all of us so we can be better dentists. So again, thank you very much, OfficeSite, and, uh, and thank you all for attending. All the best. Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Rondo, and thank you for this great information today. Like you said, we want to provide um, you know, all these dentists with the best education information to help them in their practices. And, with that said, we are about to start our live Q&A session in just a moment, but in case you have to get going at the top of the hour, I did want to thank you all for joining us this evening, as well as a big thank you to Dr. Rondo and Lee Larson for being here and being able to put on this great presentation for us. Um, also, as I mentioned, you can get a free evaluation of your web, uh, your web presence, and we'd love to help you with that. So if you want to reach out to me at... Um, T Wazinski at OfficeSite.com. That's T W A S I N S K I at OfficeSite.com. Um, I could set you up with an appointment and get you started with that. So we can set you something up either tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, and now I am going to paste that link for your CE test in, in the chat box. I'm going to go ahead and send that over. Um, you should get a link in the chat if you take a look at that. And that, uh, that's the test that you'll take to get your CE credit. Um, I'll also include that link in our follow-up email from this session as well, so just keep an eye out for that. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get to the questions that have come in. So, um, Dr. Renner, the first question that we have is, how long does splint therapy last? Well, usually it's four to six months uh, to stabilize the jaw. So you want to stabilize the TMJ, you want to get rid of the clenching and ruxing habits. And But some patients who have no money will stay with the splints longer. I mean, they can wear the splints longer if they want. Uh, the only thing is the splints are plastic and they will wear down, uh, particularly the daytime one, the repositioning splint, in which case we'd have to maybe add some triad, as I showed you in the first case, to keep the patient healthy. But if the patient has no money or they're university students or whatever, we can keep them going for several years with those splints. But usually, 
after four to six months, we have a discussion with the patient, say, do you want to keep going with a temporary solution or do you want a permanent solution? And then I offer some permanent solutions. But my favorite permanent solution, of course, is obviously ortho because I get the teeth established in the correct position and it's much more stable and it's more natural. Great. Thank you for that. The, uh, the next question we have that's come in is, um, when are you ready to go to phase two ortho? I think <clears throat> you have to make sure <clears throat> excuse me, that the, that the patient's signs and symptoms are better. So again, I would hand out that TMJ health questionnaire form that I'm hoping they're all going to try and get a hold of by, by emailing our office, lee at rondosemmers.com. We'll send that to you. Run it off, and I recommend you do it in colored paper. So run it off and give them that before treatment and give it after treatment. And then if the TMJ health questionnaire, if they fill it out and they're answering no to everything instead of yes to everything, and you know the symptoms are much better, then I do the range of motion. I take out my ruler and do range of motion and make sure that that they're opening normally and moving to the right or left normally. Went over that in the course. Um, if they do those two things, the, the symptoms are gone and their range of motion is normal and they have no headaches and no pain, then that's the time to go to phase two. If we're not successful in phase one, we don't go to phase two. Great, great. So um, it looks like we have a couple minutes left. Uh, we got about a time for one or two more questions. So if anybody has any qu burning questions, they want to get their last minute thoughts or questions in on the webinar, go ahead and type that in the questions tab. Otherwise, um, the last question that we have for now is what, is, what if the patient only brucks and grinds their teeth at night and doesn't click? How many splints do you need? Right. If the patient only clenches and bruxes at night, and you can notice that by looking at the attrition um, on the teeth, and you can look for F fractions and wear facets on the teeth, and they're only clenching and bruxing. And also, if, if they wake up, remember they're waking up and their jaws are sore and their teeth are sore, and they wake up with headaches, then that's all, and they're not clicking. They only need the Ferrari. They only need the night appliance. We call it the anterior deprogrammer to deprogram the muscles. So that's all they would need, just the, just the Ferrari night appliance. The, the day appliance, as I told, I repeated myself many times tonight, mm -hmm. in an effort to make it really simple for everybody, because I mean, I'm trying to get you all away from that night guard, because every day they're coming in with night guards and they're not working. Now, I will say this, the, the night guard will work in an acute injury. Let's say someone punches you in the head or something or you, and you have an acute injury. If you put the night guard in, it'll work because it'll just, until the, the uh, inflammation in the joint goes down, then the patient will feel they won't like the night guard. So first of all, when you put it in, they'll feel great. And after that, they'll say, you know, it hurts me. Well, that's the time to take it out. Or if it's an occlusal problem because the night guard will cancel the occlusion. So if it's an occlusal problem, rather than adjust the occlusion, put a night guard, it'll work. But those are the only two cases where it works. Really, the, the anterior programmer is the one that, that you need for nighttime, not the night guard. The Ferrari, not the night guard. Okay, so that's great. great. Well, thanks, Thank everybody, for coming out. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think that's about all we have time for today. So if there are any other remaining questions or anything, um, Dr. Rano does have um, contact information on the screen, any questions you may think of after the webinar or anything like that. Um, and of course, feel free to reach out for me for any um, web presence evaluation. And again, big thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. And of course, to Dr. Rondo for putting together this great um, presentation. It's really informative. And we um, are excited to have you here. And, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for responding, Tracy. Good night, everybody. Of course. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.